I'm delighted to welcome you all to this very special occasion and, and many thanks to, to all of you for, for coming. And it's my great pleasure to, to introduce our special speaker tonight, Kate Pickett. Uh, Kate is Professor of Epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York, uh, where her research focuses on the social determinants uh, of health. Now, Kate was a UK NIHR career scientist from 2007 to 2012. She's a fellow of the RSA. Uh, and of the UK Faculty of Public Health. And she co-authored with Richard Wilkinson uh, the, the best-selling book, uh, Spirit Level, uh, which won the 2012 Publication of the Year from the Political Studies uh, Association. And Spirit Level has been a revelation that has been translated into 23 languages, and I believe it's important lessons for all of us, certainly for politicians, possibly for vice-chancellors. And about, uh, and it is about why we should campaign for a society that has uh, greater equality. Kate is a, a co-founder of the Equality Trust. Uh, she was a commissioner of the York uh, Fairness Commission and is now a commissioner for the Living Wage Commission. Indeed, we had a conversation with her earlier on about the university introducing the living wage, which we are determined to do. She's a member of the campaign for uh, the uh, Childhood Committee of the Children's Society, sits on the Scientific Council of Inequality Watch, the Scientific Board of the Progressive Economy, and is a member of the Human Capital Research Working Group of the Institute of New Economic Thinking. She is also on the Steering Committee for the Alliance for Sustainability and Prosperity. We were absolutely del delighted when Kate accepted this invitation, and we look forward now to hearing her lecture. Kate. for that very, very warm welcome and thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's lovely for me to be in North Wales because actually this is the tiny bit of the globe where my heart lives. I spent a lot of time as a teenager working here in North Wales with my aunt and uncle in Capital Curragh up the road and um, burdened my children with Welsh names because North Wales means so much to me, so it's lovely to come and, and spend an evening with you. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about children tonight, because this is an important memorial lecture for somebody who, who put children at the centre of their life's work. So I do want to focus on the impact of inequality on children. I'll try and leave plenty of time for questions at the end so we can have a, a bit back and forth. But um, I'll start with this chart, because many people don't like statistics. If you asked our incoming graduate students at the University of York which course they're most nervous about, they always say statistics. Um, if you go and try and do a talk that's all about statistics, it's very off-putting for a lot of people. But if you can understand this chart, <laughs> then you don't need to understand everything else. <coughs> Basically, our research shows that as income inequality increases, a whole range of health and social problems increase. So, <coughs> snapshot that one in your mind, and anything else is just sort of talking around the issue. But I thought I'd start with this. Okay, so this isn't quite as simple as that. But look at the thick black line there. What we're looking at here is um, mortality in children aged 0 to 14 years in lots of different European countries over time. And we're starting on the um, left in 1986 and going up through 2007. This is a study from the British Medical Journal. And if you look at that thick black line, that's the UK. So you can see that at the start of this time period, we were among the better of the countries, you know. Um, we, we, we weren't doing so badly in terms of mortality rates. But over time, everybody's mortality rate, everybody's child mortality rates have declined, but ours have declined more slowly than other countries. And so we've now sort of crossed the line, and we are now the country among this group that has the worst child mortality out of that group. And I think it's important that we take a sort of an international lens, an international focus, because we need to know how well are we doing in comparison to 
other Western European rich countries, you know, how are our children doing in comparison to others? And if we look at this, it suggests we used to be doing right, but we're doing less well over time. Some of you will remember the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing being published in 2007. Got a lot of media attention in our country because the UK, UK came absolute bottom. So here we are, this is out of 21 rich countries and we're at the bottom. Our politicians responded by saying the data were rather old. Um, They'd made a lot of progress, but they really didn't want to engage with and address the fact that on so many dimensions of child well-being, we came bottom of this group of countries. So there are 21 countries um, in, this, in this group. Um, we come 18th for material well-being, you know, that's poverty, things like that. We did quite well on health and safety, and that's because we're extremely good at preventing road accidents. Traffic safety in the UK is much, much better than in most countries, so that pulled us up a bit. Sorry, 12th in that, yeah. 17th in educational well-being, which isn't very good. Absolute bottom in family and peer relationships. Our children do not find their peers kind and helpful. They are much more likely to experience bullying than children in other countries. And absolute bottom in behaviours and risks. Our children are far more likely to be binge drinking or having sex before the age of 15, engaging in other risky behaviours. And <coughs> next to bottom for subjective well-being. So we really were not doing very well at all. But what explains that? If you look at the income that's available to families in different countries, we're not doing so badly at all. So here we are. This is the OECD countries, I think. Let's check. Yes, it is. Um, and out of those countries, you know, we, we have reasonable amounts of income. And there are countries with much lower levels of income for example Spain, they're doing much, much better than us on measures of child well-being. So it isn't the average level of income that's really mattering. And it isn't the public spending on children either. So here we've got um, public spending on family benefits, the blue part of the bar is cash benefits, um, the red is services and the yellow is tax breaks um, for families. And again, we're sort of right here in the middle. And the green line is the OECD median, so we're certainly spending more than the OECD average. And again, there are lots of countries further down the line with better child well-being who spend far less money, um, public money, on supporting families. Now, it's not all bad news because in 2009 the OECD produced cross-country comparisons of child well-being and we're not at the bottom anymore in this one. We're just close to the bottom. And they've added some countries like the Czech Republic, um, Slovak Republic, Mexico, where perhaps you wouldn't expect. But we've switched positions with the United States. And UNICEF produced um, a new report of its index of child well-being last year in 2013. We're not at the bottom of that anymore, but that's because they've added Bulgaria and Romania and um, countries like that below us. So however you look at it, we're not doing well and we're not really getting better over time. Our levels of child well-being are pretty poor. Now, this is looking at the child well-being index that UNICEF produced in 2007 in relation to national income per person. And we find there's no relationship whatsoever. So you can have poorer countries doing um, quite well, poorer countries do, not doing so well, rich countries like Norway doing very well, rich countries like the USA 
not doing well at all. So there's no relationship at all between average standards of living and child well-being. But if we plot that same index of child well-being against the measure of income distribution of inequality, instead of against the average levels of income, we get a very different picture. A statistically significant relationship between lower levels of inequality and higher levels of child well-being. So up at the top, you've got some of the Nordic countries and the Netherlands doing very, very well. Down at the bottom, Israel, New Zealand, UK and US doing very poorly. And that correlation, I think it's about 0.67 for those of you who, who like those kinds of numbers. It's a strong correlation, it can't be explained by chance alone. And the same is true in the United States. Um, the United States produces different indices of child well-being. Um, we looked at two, the Foundation for Child Development, which has 25 items in it, the Kids Count Index, which has 10 items in it. They are both significantly related to income inequality, but also to average incomes in the United States. So wider scatter than we see for the um, international comparison of rich countries, but a significant tendency for child well-being to be higher in the more equal states. And that's important because it tells you that it's not something culturally specific about these more equal countries that explains the relationship, because we see it in the US states as well. People often look at, our, um, at this graph and at our own <coughs> index of health and social problems in adults um, and say, oh, well, it's something peculiar about the Scandinavian countries. You know, they're just not like us. They're a bit weird. Yeah. Or they say, it's, it's something peculiar about the English-speaking countries. They're just not very nice and, and they're weird. But generally, looking at this index and looking at our own index of adult problems, you know, you can take off those Scandinavian countries, you can take off the English-speaking countries, you've still got a relationship between inequality and problems that you need to explain. So it's not due to cultural differences between countries. So we've looked at a, a wide range of child outcomes related to income inequality, both in international comparisons and across US states. And these are the ones that show significant relationships. And I'm going to show you some of those relationships. Um, Partly to demonstrate the scale of the differences that seem to be explained by inequality. So I'll start with infant mortality rates. And infant mortality is often viewed as a really good measure of how a country looks after its families, how it promotes well-being. Now, if you're sitting at at the back, you'd probably think that that line, which is just a regression line between the two things, actually ought to be steeper and go up like that. But it's pulled down by Singapore. Yeah. Singapore has the lowest infant mortality rate anywhere in the world and doesn't fit at all with this picture. So I spent loads and loads of time trying to prove that Singapore's data was wrong. <laughs> Because, you know, that's what you do when you're a scientist and something unexpected comes up, you delve into it. I couldn't prove that their data were wrong. I couldn't find any indication of that. But what I did find out was that Singapore, which is essentially a city-state more than it is a country, has a huge population of guest workers. And if you're working in Singapore and you get pregnant, you go home. So there's probably a lot of missing infant deaths from the lower classes of that population that are just not happening within Singapore. They also have been very worried about um, the tendency of, of people in Singapore who are very highly educated not to marry and have lots of children. So they've done quite a lot to try and promote it. And in fact, at one point, the government set up a dating service for people who've got a university education. Because they had noticed that university-educated men didn't like to marry university-educated women. So they set up a dating service for them. How much that explains that figure, I don't know. But whether Singapore is included or not, 
There is still a significant association between levels of infant mortality and income inequality. Here's child overweight, overweight under obesity, same relationship again. Here the outlier is the United States. Um, these data are quite old now, so I'm guessing that we'll be, we'll be shooting up, up that way. Um, levels of overweight and obesity higher in more equal countries, and that's true for adults as well. And here are educational scores. These are the results from the Programme for International Student Assessment from 2003, which was the most recent available to us when we were writing our book. Um, they now have additional countries included, and Finland has lost its top place, which it held for many, many years, um, many waves of PISA assessment. But again, a significant relationship between the average of the maths and the reading scores in um, educational attainment. Um, the UK is not on that one because in 2003 not enough schools would take part in the programme for international student assessment for us to be able to have robust data for the UK. But we're, we're pretty abysmal. As you will have heard recently with the new results. Can we ask you if these pictures you're showing are weighted by population? They are not weighted by population. If you weight by population, the, the associations get stronger. Which is because the most equal country in our data set is Japan. The most unequal is the USA. And those are the two biggest. Um, we do have small countries at both ends. So we've got very, very large USA here, and Portugal, pretty small, and again, large countries like Japan and the Scandinavian ones at the other end. So if you weight by population, the associations get stronger. I, I'm not sure there's any valid reason to do it either. Um, so these are, the, these are the crude, unadjusted associations. Looking at children dropping out of high school, in the United States, and you know, in, in the US, you go to school until you're 18, as all our children are about to do, um, and you graduate with a um, high school diploma. And if you don't achieve that, you basically not achieve the expected standard of education. So it's a bit like leaving school in the UK and not having five GCSEs. But dropping out of high school is, is a really strong predictor of later health and social problems strongly related to inequality. So down in the more equal of the US states, got Alaska here, Utah, New Hampshire, Iowa, Wisconsin, you know, it's less than 15% dropping out, still pretty high, um, but it's close to a third up in the more unequal of the US states. And here are teenage birth rates. So these are births to young women aged 15 to 19 years. Um, Highly significant relationship. The UK has the highest rate um, of any country in Western Europe. And there's the USA way up there. But in a way, these crude figures actually disguise something even more um, important. Japan, for instance, has very, very low rates of teenage births. But the vast majority of young women having babies in Japan are married. So they're having them in a sort of expected social context. Whereas in the UK, the USA, the vast majority of young women having babies are not. They're having them in a completely different social context. And here's um, income inequality and school bullying from a colleague in Canada, Frank Elgar. And he's looking at a much bigger set of countries than we looked at. He's using the World Health Organization <coughs> survey that's called health and behaviour in school aged children, I think. It always sounds like the bank, HSBC, but it's the other way around, HBSC, I think. Um, but again, a significant relationship between income inequality and bullying. Very, very strong correlation there. And we've looked at child conflict in rich countries, both bullying and um, being, both being a victim and a perpetrator of bullying, and both of those are more evident in more unequal countries. 
And I think this is probably the last of these sort of single factors. This is social mobility. Now, across the political divide, you will not find anybody who doesn't think that equality of opportunity is a good thing. Yeah? We all think that children should have the same opportunities, whoever their parents are, wherever they're born. Now, we don't have this for as many countries as we have lots, lots of other things, because it's quite hard to measure social mobility. And what we're looking at here is intergenerational income mobility. So we're basically answering the question, do rich parents have rich children? Do poor parents have poor children, children who go on to be poor? Or is there a possibility to move up and down society? And the measure here is the correlation between a father's income when his son is born and that son's income 30 years later. And the reason it's only fathers and sons is because we didn't have enough women in the workforce um, in the past to be able to get stable measures here. And the reason we only have it for a few countries is because we have it for countries that have got good nationally representative birth cohort studies like we have in the UK, or they can do it through record linkage like the Scandinavians can do because they know where you are all the time. <laughs> so, social mobility is much higher in the more equal societies and much lower in the more unequal ones. It's been stagnant in the UK for about the past four decades, which is when our income inequality really took off. And here is the land of opportunity. <laughs> so we often say, if you really want to live the American dream, you're better off in Denmark. <laughs> Which is funny, but it's not. Because in a way, we have a mythology in the UK that if you work hard and if you have enough aspiration, you know, you can, you can make your way. They certainly believe that in the USA, where I lived for 16 years. And, the, you know, the idea of the American dream it isn't, it isn't just sort of something that gets talked about in, in some policy level. People really believe it. You know, they really do believe they live in a country where if you work hard and make the most of your opportunity, you can get ahead. But actually, in those two societies, you can see it's much, much more difficult. You can't have equality of opportunity without greater equality of outcome. Uh, so the next point I want to make, as well as income inequality affecting a whole range of, of child outcomes, is that it affects everybody in society, not just the poor. So we're not just talking about an impact on the, the poorest in the population and the rest of us are okay. Income inequality affects all of us. And just like studying social mobility, this is quite challenging to do, because what you need to be able to do is to compare people at the same socio-economic position in different societies, which is methodologically quite difficult. Um, but researchers from um, London and Sweden spent painstaking years of their lives reclassifying infant deaths in Sweden um, using our UK social class <coughs> system. So they made the data comparable. Um, and on both certificates, you get um, fathers, occupational class, social class. So it's arranged by that. So we have single mothers here, um, who in both Sweden, which is the dark bars, and England and Wales have the highest um, infant mortality rates of all. But then we've got this whole range of infant mortality rates classified by fathers, social class. So across the board, you see higher infant mortality in a more unequal England and Wales. But you see the gap exists all the way up to the top. So even in the very, very highest social class, where we're talking about professional people with high incomes, lots of education, there is still an inequality gap between the infant mortality rates for Sweden and England and Wales. And we see this pattern for health in um, lots of different 
studies. Well, they're not lots, but we don't have that many, but, but we see it consistently in, in health studies. And I had a PhD student working with me who's just finished, who's been looking at things you can measure in early childhood that are really good predictors of later health and social well-being. So she's been looking at height and cognitive development and emotional and behavioural problems. We see the same pattern, the same sort of fanning out. Income inequality affects those at the bottom of the social scale more, but its effects persist all the way up society. So that even the children of people in the you know, richest 10% by income or the top 20% by education um, still show a deficit related to inequality. And here's one more example of that. These data come from um, Doug Wilms in Canada, and he's looking at educational achievement of young people is their literacy scores <coughs> arranged by the number of years of education their parents have had. So down here you've got the scores of children whose parents don't have much education all the way up to, to the highest. And you can see that you know, we've got the most equal country in Sweden, <coughs> Canada comes back in the middle of the income distribution for rich countries, the United States among the worst. It's a big gap at the bottom. So if your parents don't have much education, it matters a lot more that you live in a more equal, less, or less equal country. But it matters even at the very top. So this, this fanning out we see typically, but we see those differences at the top of society. And colleagues at Harvard, you know, another group who do a lot of research on inequality, describe it as a social pollutant because its effects are so pervasive. So why are children so sensitive to inequality? You know, if you believe these relationships that I've shown, and we have good evidence to believe that they are causal relationships, and I don't have time to go into, into the detail of this now, but we're not doing questions. <coughs> How is it, why is it, that we are so sensitive to inequality? Why are children so sensitive to inequality? And really three, um, three things might be going on. Maybe it's just the effects of relative poverty. You know, and poor families just don't have enough. But we've already seen that the effects of inequality tend to go all the way up society. Maybe it's a direct impact on family life and relationships that then indirectly gets fed through to children. And maybe it has a direct effect on children themselves, um, their own experience of increased status differentiation in more unequal societies. So let's sort of go through some evidence about that. I'm going to ignore the fact that it might be explained by relative poverty because it's quite clear that it can't. So I'll move on to thinking about how inequality might affect family life and relationships. So here we're looking at adults, not children. But this is the percent with any mental illness in the past year. Um, data come from the World Health Organization, surveys that are designed to overcome the cultural problems of trying to measure these things in different societies. So down in the more equal societies, we've got um, levels of mental illness less than 10% of the population in the past year. In the UK, it's 23%. Okay? And in the US, it's 26%, so more than one in four. <coughs> Now, when we first published this in the British Journal of Psychiatry, the psychiatrist wrote in and said, do Wilkinson and Pickett truly believe that 23% of the adult population had some kind of mental illness in the past year? So I started to count on my fingers, and I thought, well, it was me. <laughs> quite a lot of people in my family, quite a lot of friends, loads of colleagues. I think it's probably an underestimate. But, um, but in a way, he's asking the wrong question. Because the question isn't, is that 23% accurate? You know, maybe it should be a bit higher, maybe it should be a bit lower. Maybe we're over-pathologizing things and labeling people as mentally ill when they shouldn't be. But really the question is, why are there such big differences between countries? They're all 
answer the same kinds of questions about symptoms. Why are there such big differences and why are they so strongly correlated with income inequality? And whether you think this is measuring classifiable mental illness or not, it is certainly measuring suffering and distress. It is certainly picking up on a high proportion of people in more unequal countries answering questions that express their suffering and distress. So if we have 23% of the adult population in the UK with some level of distress in the past year, that's probably an awful lot of parents. You know, this is all adults, not just parents, but that's probably an awful lot of parents. Similarly, we see um, this is use of illegal drugs in more unequal countries. We certainly see higher levels of that in more unequal societies as well. So inequality is probably having some kind of impact on adults who are parents that is affecting the kinds of things that will affect the kinds of parents they are and the kind of environment um, they can provide for their children. But it's not just sort of psychosocial impacts of inequality. Inequality has it, it's sort of very important effects on, on the way work is constructed. So these are data from economists, um, Canadian economists, looking at the work hours for different countries in relation to inequality. And in Norway, people work nine weeks less on average than people in the United States. And the UK is up there as a very, very high um, average annual work hours. I was listening to the radio as I drove here today and um, David Campbell was saying that his newly proposed child benefit scheme will allow people to work more hours. <laughs> it would be much nicer if we had a scheme that allowed people to work fewer hours and spend more time with their families. Um, but we certainly have a very high um, level of work commitment, and this, of course, applies to parents too. And then inequality also affects debt. Um, very close relationship. Household debt increases as inequality goes up. When inequality is higher, status matters more. Your position in society matters more. <coughs> Keeping up, presenting a good front matters more. And how do we express our status in modern societies? We buy stuff. We buy a bigger house, or we get another car, or we buy extremely expensive handbags, or whatever your particular thing is for, for expressing your status. But we don't only do it when we can afford it. We go into debt to do it. So there's a strong relationship between income inequality and debt. So if you think about the impact of inequality on mental well-being of adults and working hours and debt, you've got a pretty toxic mix, actually, for parents being able to provide the best environment they can for their children. But let's move on and think about whether or not income inequality might have a direct effect on children, how they perceive um, the world. These data come from a really interesting experiment from researchers at the World Bank. And they're working with Indian schoolboys. And they brought them into um, a lab setting and they asked them to solve a number of puzzles. And they were doing those maze puzzles, you know, we have to find a way from the outside into the middle. How many could they do in a given time? And when the boys didn't know each other's cast, and here we've got the high caste boys in blue, the low caste boys in turquoise. When they didn't know each other's caste, they performed equally well. When they had to go around the room and announce their caste to each other, the performance of the low caste boys plummeted. And this, this effect is a lot more common than you would think. So researchers in America have shown the same thing for African-American and white high school and college students. Give them a test and tell them it's just a test and they perform equally well. 
tell the listening intelligence test, the performance of the black children goes down because they are aware of the stereotypes that people hold about them. And I'm afraid, ladies in the audience, we do the same when given tests that are about maths and spatial relationships. We do just as well as the guys if we're just left to get on with it. But if before we do the test we're told science has shown that women aren't very good at these things, then our performance goes down. And in fact we are so sensitive to this stereotype that we only have to tick a box at the top of the form that says male or female and our performance goes down. And psychologists call a stereotype threat. If you feel that other people judge you negatively based on some characteristic, then that affects your cognitive performance. And psychologists have also shown that people judging you negatively is the most consistent predictor of increased stress levels. We are incredibly sensitive to how other people see us. We experience ourselves through other people's eyes. And in a more unequal society, that just gets ratcheted upwards. Now, when we wrote our book, we were relying on experience like this to interpret our findings. But in the five years since then, we've started to see more and more studies coming through that are actually explicitly linking inequality to things like levels of social uh, self-status anxiety in different societies, of um, people's willingness to help each other out, social solidarity, um, of the stereotypes that people hold about each other. So it's, it's, that story is getting stronger and stronger um, the more evidence that comes out. Now we know that inequalities become entrenched really early in life. A lot of you will know about the Millennium Cohort Study, which is our most recent birth cohort study in the UK, following children born around the millennium. Um, and when they were examined at three years of age, they were able to look at cognitive development in the children. And the children with the most educated parents were 12 months ahead of those who lose their education. This is about three years. So we've already got a year-long gap in cognitive development at age three. Children in families with incomes below the poverty line were about eight months behind those <coughs> with incomes above it. Um, and children from um, various ethnic minority backgrounds were scoring low as well. So even before our children go to school, they are set on a trajectory. They will enter school with different, what looks like natural ability, but isn't. Cognitive development, IQ, don't let anybody tell you it's natural born talent. It is shaped by inequality. It is shaped by poverty. <coughs> and it's shaped very, very early on. And then those children are on completely different trajectories to others. They will be viewed differently by teachers. They will be viewed differently by anyone who interacts with them in a service capacity. They will be viewed differently um, by society. And it starts really early. So just like politicians across the political spectrum agreeing that social mobility is a good thing, they all think early childhood intervention is a good thing too. But then they're usually talking about three to five years. It's got to be earlier. We've got to get in there earlier and try and prevent that from happening. We know that things that children are exposed to very early on um, can affect their health and well-being throughout life. I'll skip, I'll skip very quickly through this because I'm sure you all know that. And we know that things that happen just after children are born, poor attachment, maternal depression, have very lifelong effects on children. So I think we need to think about more unequal societies as priming a different kind of parenting um, and response. So I think this is quite, quite a useful story, and some of you may remember this case. Um, 
a mother who had encouraged her two toddlers to fight each other and filmed it um, was sentenced to a 12 month suspended sentence along with her own mother, so the children's grandmother and her two sisters. <coughs> Some of you remember this? Yeah. Um, the father of the children was out of the country at the time, he was in the armed forces, and when he came home and saw the video, I think he handed it to police. Um, they all admitted that they had done this, um, but they all were rather unrepentant. They felt they were doing the right thing. They felt they were sort of toughening up their kids. They thought it's a tough world out there, and if you can't fight for yourself, you know, what are you going to do? And I think. I think this is an important sort of response to inequality and poverty. If you think the world out there is harsh and it's a dog-eat-dog, fight-for-yourself, individualistic, materialistic society, you bring your children up differently than if you think it's a nice, caring, sharing society where everybody's going to look out for each other. So parenting styles prepare children for the kind of social relationships they may have to deal with as children and as adults. So we can flip. You know, we have lived as human beings in societies that are incredibly cooperative, um, reciprocal, collaborative, and we've lived in extremely hierarchical, nasty, individualistic, non-trusting societies. We manage both. We're very, very flexible. But we get socialized into those worlds. And so if you're raising children in a difficult, rough area, you think schools are tough, you know, you may be preparing them consciously to deal with that world. And you wouldn't have to do that if you lived in a different kind of society. So as well as the direct effects of inequality on adults, and the direct effects of inequality on children, there's also this sort of priming idea, this idea that you prepare your children as best as you can for the world they're going to have to live in. And if it's not a nice world, you perhaps foster different kinds of qualities. Um, before I end, because I do want to leave lots of time for questions, I wanted to mention um, a couple of reports that came out 2011 and 2012, because I think they were very illuminating, and some of you might um, be interested in them. Um, one was a report from Ipsos Mori and Dr. Agnes Nan, and um, it was a study of children's well-being in three countries, the UK, Sweden, and Spain. And they did this in response to, um, really, to sort of government's reaction to the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing. You know, where the government say, well, actually, um, the data are rather old and we've been making progress. The government also said, those are just statistics. <laughs> they don't tell us about the real lives of families. So in this study, the researchers went and did ethnographic anthropological research in families in the UK, Sweden, and Spain. They spent a lot of time with them, they filmed them, there's lots and lots of questions. And I was privileged to be on the advisory board for that study and saw the videos that they made. And I found it quite heartbreaking, actually, as a UK parent. In Sweden, there's a real sense of sharing parenting across genders, and a real sense of involving children in decisions in the household, spending a lot of time with them. You know, it all looked pretty, pretty idyllic, really. In Spain, a lot of the women were a bit pissed off because the men don't do much parenting in Spain. But the extended family helps a lot. And the families all eat together. And as families, they do spend quite a lot of time sort of at weekends on, on sports and different activities. In the films of the UK parents, you know what, they were just knackered. They were exhausted. They were tired. They were depressed. Their children had loads of stuff. Mountains of toys and things. But the parents didn't have any energy to spend any time with them. This was rich families as well as poor families. And the kids talked about how important it was to have things. 
you know, to have things that, that said you were an okay person. And the contrast was was so strong and it was it was really a sort of visual and sort of qualitative expression of everything I showed you in the statistics tonight. And when that report came out, you know what the government said? It's just a few families. No statistics. So you do need both. You do need both. The Children's Society continues to run the, so the Good Childhood Report year on year. They talk to children about what they want. And what children want isn't stuff, actually. When children are asked to describe what would a really good day be, they say it's hanging out with their families. Maybe they'd go to the park. It's all about time and togetherness and relationships. It's not actually about trainers and iPads. And I'm probably showing my ignorance here. There are probably much more desirable things that I don't know about. My children have grown out of having the nerve to ask me for the money for them. <laughs> But that's what children want. And actually, that's what parents want. Time with their families. You know, nobody lies down on their deathbed and says, I wish I'd spent more time in the office, do they? Or earned a bit more money. But we have choices. And I think what the international comparison shows is that societies have choices about how they construct themselves, how they act, how they support families. Different societies make different choices, and we just seem to have been on a path for making some pretty poor choices for quite a long time. But, at least inequality is sort of back on the agenda. People are talking about it more. I do think it's becoming a more central issue, politically and in policy terms. So maybe it's the turning of the tide. And we did used to be a much more equal society. And we did used to do much better in supporting families and children. So maybe we can get back there again. I'm going to leave you with just this one up, because this is the Equality Trust which we founded in 2009, in case you're interested in following any of this up. Um, our website, the address is at the very, very top. We publish new research, um, lots of news. Um, we have lots of local inequality groups. We've got one in South Wales. I don't think we've got one in North Wales. Anybody would like to take up the challenge? Um, and we try to work sort of nationally and locally to promote greater equality. But I'll stop now and thank you very, very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Yeah, got a microphone here, so we've got a question, but there hasn't been. Hello, Kate. I'm Jane Noyes from the School of Healthcare Sciences. It's nice to see you again. Um, you focused on children um, very ably. Um, would you also sort of um, think about commenting on the, the role of women? We know now that um, probably about one in five women don't have children. Do you think there's a relationship with, um, about women making choices not to have kids in this day and age? Because it's such an epidemiological change as well. Do you want me to answer that one or do you want to take a batch? Uh, whichever you prefer, you want some more? Yeah, okay. Hi, Jane. I don't know, that, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I suppose, in a way, the way our society is structured at the moment is that women feel it's, it's quite a difficult choice compared to some other societies where combining motherhood and work, you know, and career is different. I'm not aware of any studies that actually look at fertility rates in relationship to income inequality, but that would be really interesting. We certainly know that more equal societies have more gender equality. And that's true of US states as well. But the measures of that, you know, the measures of women's equality that are used in those studies are things like the pay gap between men and women, um, the proportion of women in the parliament, um, the proportion of women who go on to higher education, things like that. They're not actually looking at things like um, family formation um, and the choices that women make. 
but I think I think that's a really sort of fruitful area for more research. So thanks for raising it. Thanks for very interesting talk. Um, I'm curious as to whether you think that inequality is sort of mechanistically kind of causing a lot of the social problems, or whether you think that it's a kind of something that it's kind of easy to measure and that captures sort of different kind of structures in society, and so sort of is a good way of measuring it, but not necessarily if it's causing it. So I mean, mm. no, that's a good question, um, and the answer is. Yes and yes, really. Um, <coughs> I mean, income inequality is, it is quite a simple, sort of straightforward thing to measure. And we do now have comparable data for lots of different countries, um, which we didn't have in the past. And we don't have that for things like wealth inequality. So in some ways, we're, we're in some ways, we're using income inequality as a proxy for how hierarchical a society is. Um, you can't use things like social class measures for that because let's say you wanted to compare England and France and you classified everybody in France on the same social class system we've got here, which you could do. You'd know that maybe you'd know there were more people in the working class here than in France. But you, you wouldn't know what, what, what sort of the, the scale of the differences was between the top and the bottom, how hierarchical that society was. So income inequality is a really useful measure for that. But it's more than just a proxy, because I think in, our incomes are very, very important to our status and our social position. So money has a meaning that isn't just about what, what you can buy with it, but it has a social meaning as well, a status meaning as well. So I actually think it's, it's an incredibly useful measure as a proxy for lots of things, but as, as, as meaningful in itself as well. Um, thanks for the really interesting talk. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> the I was just wondering uh, what, it, from your research, what kind of policy suggestions do you think uh, politicians should be taking up to respond to this? And also, reflecting on the fact that you're suggesting society was more equal when you're know, back probably before the 70s, 60s, what do you think policy-wise assured that kind of equality occurred? Mm. Um, in terms of policy, I mean, at first we felt that wasn't our job. You know, we're not policy experts, we're epidemiologists. We thought our job was to sort of point out the problem and then somebody else would do the policy stuff. Um, but on platform after platform, you know, politicians turn around and go, so what do we do about it? Um, in a way, what our research shows is that it doesn't matter how you get there, right? It doesn't matter how you achieve your greater equality, it just matters that you get there. So Sweden, for instance, it's the second most equal of our countries, does it through redistribution. So a strong welfare system and progressive taxation. Japan has smaller income differences to start with. Doesn't have a strong welfare state, doesn't do a lot of taxing. Um, but it doesn't seem to matter. And in the United States we see the same thing. So we have two states next door to each other, New Hampshire and Vermont, who both do very well in terms of health and social problems. But they are completely different. In, in sort of taxation and, and, um, and welfare, they're, they're like Japan and Sweden. So Vermont is more like Sweden, and New Hampshire, state motto is live free or die, is, is, is more, like, more like Japan, um, but has had strong union protections. So it, it doesn't seem to matter what you choose, and that's good because it means there's a whole range of policy options for people. I mean, obviously things like progressive taxation and redistribution are important, but the problem with those is that those are government imposed. You have to have a mandate to be able to believe you can do those things. And at the moment, we tend to view taxes as the government robbing us of something, rather than as seeing it as a way we contribute to society, which I think is very unfortunate. We need a bit of a campaign and buttons that say, I'm pleased to pay my taxes and things. Um, but also the next, let's say you get the mandate, put progressive taxation in, the next government could turn it around. So actually I think what, what we feel more and more in favour of are things that get greater, greater equality more deeply embedded in the culture. 
And that is all forms of economic democracy. Because the massive rise in inequality we've seen in the UK over the past few decades has really been the runaway increase of the top. It's that top salary bonus culture. It's the rich just feeling they can grab more and more of pie, and that's okay. And any kind of economic democracy puts a constraint on that. Yeah? So if you've got employee representation on company boards, especially on remuneration boards, some EU countries have very strong regulations about that, we don't. Um, if you've got strong unions, if you've got more cooperatives and employee and companies and mutuals and things like that, that gets equality more deeply embedded in the place where income differences are set. And that's harder for an incoming government to sort of turn around. What, what kept us more equal in the middle of the last century? Because there's a massive sort of U-shaped um, pattern of income distribution in most rich countries, very, very strong in the UK and the US. We were very, very unequal, really sort of up through the 1930s, then it got a lot, lot better. And that lasted all the way through to, guess when? <laughs> 1979. And then it sort of all, all took off again. That, I mean, it was politics, it was politics and ideology. Um, we saw greater equality in part, I think, because politicians wanted to compensate their populations for um, the deprivations they'd suffered during the war. They also were very worried about the rise of the communist East. They offered a lot of, of greater equality for those reasons, I think. And then we saw the change around with the um, coming in of neoliberal ideology. And that's what tipped it upwards. So we need a bit of political gumption and leadership, I think, to take us back. Um, but my question is very much linked to what you've just been talking about. Um, have you actually done any lobbying? Um, you talked about the response of, I, pre I presume, this government. Um, the first thing saying it wants statistics, the other one's only families. Um, I'm sitting here as, as someone who works in education um, and looking at what's happening in England, particularly with education, and thinking, yes, you're right, it's on the agenda. Yeah. And the practice at the moment is only going to exacerbate everything you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so, h have you been able to directly or indirectly approach parties and who has responded well to you? That's what I'd like to know. Okay. Well, we certainly have tried to lobby. I mean, we tend to go to party political conferences. Um, we also tend to try and lobby directly through the Equality Trust. Um, and we try and do things at local, national and international levels. So I'll sort of take those separately. At local level, we've been deeply involved with the fairness commissions that have been set up with <coughs> lots of different local authorities. The first was Islington. And Richard, my co-author, chaired that um, Fairness Commission. We both served on the York one. And I think we've spoken to all of the ones that have been set up so far. Um, and all of the Fairness Commission so far have committed to a living wage. Some of them also in, in, in procurement and contracting. Um, so that, that's been a positive development. Um, I think all of the local authorities that have set up fairness commissions have been either labour controlled or mixed. Um, nationally, we do lobby, um, which at the moment producing a set of manifesto commitments that we will ask all the parties to commit to and have meetings with um, the people writing the manifestos for the different parties. Um, Richard's actually got a meeting with Ed Miliband in a couple of weeks. And we're meeting John Crowder soon, who's um, in charge of doing Labour's manifesto. But we will talk to the other parties as well. Um, the most responsive party is the Green Party. One MP. Um, and internationally, we're working to try and get inequality targets into the post-2015 development goals and the new Sustainable Development Goals that the United Nations has committed to producing. We're doing that through the Alliance for Sustainability and Prosperity. 
Um, there, the main block to our work has actually been David Cameron's role as co-chair of the high-level panel advising the UN on, on the post-2015 development goals. So, I mean, it's, it's mixed, really. In a way, we've got a lot of lip service. And at least people are talking about inequality again. And it is the, that's the first step. Everything else will take longer. A few years ago, this was actually before our book was published, I was up in Scotland um, talking, and a member of the Scottish Parliament came up to me and said, love your work, it's really important, it's fantastic. And I said, great, what are you going to do about it? And he sort of backed up and said, oh, no, no, nothing, nothing. He said, we're not allowed to talk about inequality in new labour. <laughs> so that was then, and the, you know, things have changed. The International Monetary Fund is talking about inequality as a major problem. Ban Ki Moon has talked about it. President Obama has said it's the challenge of the century. I mean, even David Cameron has referred to it and said it's a problem. You know, so people are talking about it, and that is, that is the first step. And of course, the research that we do looks at the health and social impact. But what I've not showed you tonight, because I haven't had time, is there's also a very, very close relationship between inequality and sustainability issues that will help to bring inequality up, up the agenda. And economists, um, well, progressive economists, are increasingly turning their attention to the role of inequality in economic performance and economic stability and showing that inequality is bad for the economy. And that, that's a powerful sort of additional reason. So I think we will see change. It won't come tomorrow, but I think 20, 30 years? I don't know, I don't know what the time frame will be. But when I look back at the past sort of half century, I see massive social change. Massive social change. And it didn't come about because some government decided to give it to the populace. It came about because of grassroots pressure. So, I mean, in the circles I'm moving, which I admit a bit, you know, very so, but nobody says anything racist these days. That would not be okay. Nobody says anything um, nasty about women. Nobody says anything homophobic. And I hope that in time, it would be just as embarrassing to be seen to be greedy and out for yourself as it's now seen to be racist, or misogynistic, or homophobic. We'll take just two more questions. Two more. Okay, this is just really um, continuing on that, um, uh, considering lobbying and you know, convincing people that this is what they want to do. All this research comes out of universities. And I wonder, perhaps, it's time for universities to start to show that we need the equality within the system. Within the university system? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I can get behind that one. Um, well, universities are funny institutions, aren't they? And I think they're, they're more peculiar these days than they used to be. Yes. Um, Sometimes they seem a bit confused about their mission and whether or not they are you know, a public service or a corporation. Um, and I was talking to your very charming Vice-Chancellor earlier, and um, <laughs> you know, we agree in some ways, um, top salaries in university have sort of aped what's happening in the private sector. That's true in local authorities as well. Um, so you've seen chief executives of local authorities, their salaries sort of going up and up. Um, and which, is, which is part of that whole effect of income inequality, this, this ratcheting up and importance of status. So, I mean, I do, I do think we need more equality within the um, university, college sector. But not just in terms of salaries, but of course in terms of the kinds of people who come to us. Um, the kinds of teaching we do. Yeah. Um, I think we're enormously privileged to have really lovely work to do. And most of us, we don't do it for the money. You know, we do it because, because we 
we love teaching, or we love research, and, and you know, we enjoy being able to do those things. So we need to we need to resist that tendency for us to just be just be like a business, just be about growing, just be about getting bigger, just be about earning more. Yeah, we need to resist. Can we take one more question. Yeah, hi, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I think uh, I, I know not very much about what you've been talking about, but it often implies a political argument. Um, I was just wondering if the world was communist, um, what kind of correlations do you think you'd be looking at as an epidemiologist? I think it's impossible to say. I mean, the problem with communism is that it wasn't really what it was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, we've not we've not got any experience of countries pursuing a communist ideology without also bumming a lot of other stuff on top of it, which people don't like, like control, political control, um, <coughs> lots of punishment, you know. Open so, so we've not had that experiment. So we can't say. We also can't say. What would happen to health and well-being if a society had perfectly equal incomes? Because there isn't anywhere like that. So all we can do is, is, is look at the data we have. So the countries we look at are all rich, developed, market democracies. They're all capitalists. And we can, I think, say with confidence that outcomes are better in the more equal of those. But we don't. No, and can only speculate about what would happen if incomes got more and more and more equal. Um, we don't know. Some people argue that you need a certain degree of inequality to um, stimulate aspiration um, and ambition and innovation. I don't think that's true. I think what you get with greater inequality is a huge waste of human talent and potential. And actually, we find higher levels of innovation if you look at um, patents per capita in more equal societies. But I, I just don't think we know the answer to your question. Or what we can do is we could guess, but but we don't know. Um, and all we can say is that it's quite clear if we nudge a little bit, you know, move a little bit down the greater equality towards the greater equality end of the spectrum, we'll do a whole lot better. Very, very well made. In a way, we're in a very odd situation, aren't we? We had a global financial crisis, and yet we're just doing business the same as usual. Um, we're facing really quite horrendous predictions related to climate change, and World Health Organization estimates that climate change is already causing 180,000 deaths a year. Yeah. What does it take for us all to? open our eyes, wake up and get a bit angry. You know, what does it take for us all to start acting together and, and demanding change? But I'm sure you're right that in many ways the internet offers us opportunities to connect and to share and to act collectively. Um, and there are lots of models around the world of communities doing things differently and trying, trying different things out. So the more we can share that and learn from one another the better. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can ask once again. Thank you.